What does tradition have to do with Jesus, and should we stick to it? That's what we're going to talk about in Matthew 15. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Last time we talked about Jesus, the boat, Peter walking out of the boat, and the feeding of the 5,000 men, probably 20,000 people, who knows, but his compassion and care for our needs never ends. In this particular chapter, we're going to see that the Pharisees are really hot on his tail. This time, it says the Pharisees came from Jerusalem. Maybe these aren't our local podunk Pharisees, our normal synagogue Pharisees. These are the big guys coming in from the city to figure out what is going on out there. And they ask him, why do you not do the tradition for washing your hands? And Jesus gives them this message. But then Jesus challenges them and says, well, what about you? You're supposed to honor your mother and father, and anyone who reviles their mother and father should die. And yet, you will give what you're supposed to do to support your mother and father, and you give it to the temple to avoid giving it to them. It's kind of weird, because they would rather give it to the temple than give it to their parents. They're not honoring their father and mother. So they think they can avoid the Ten Commandments because they figured a way out. That's the whole story with Jesus talking to the Pharisees. It's not just that they put rules on people's hearts. It's that they try to skirt around the rules like a lawyer. Well, I didn't really murder you. I made the Romans murder you. And they can keep going on. In this case, he's challenging them and then mentions to them in Isaiah 29, 13, They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines of the commandments of men. These are things you all made up. This is not the commandments of God. You're not really worshiping me. Boy, he he let them have it in this particular piece. Then he brings up the point, what defiles a person? Is a human being defiled because they didn't wash their hands? I mean, wash your hands, but you're not defiled in the soul because you didn't wash your hands. What you eat doesn't defile you. What defiles you is what comes out of you, what comes out of your mouth. We heard in previous chapters, when you have good in you, good things come out of your mouth. When you have evil in you, bad things come out of your mouth. Pharisees were offended about this. And he goes on to say that the heavenly father didn't plant bad seeds. They will be rooted up. They're going to be taken out in another message of the plants. But they're blind. They're not looking. Again, if you have ears, hear. If you have eyes, see. And he's saying you're blind. It's the blind leading the blind, and you're all going to fall in a pit. And he says, do you still not understand this? You know, they are not paying attention, and they're not trying to listen. They're not trying to pay attention. They're trying to be mad, and they're trying to catch him. So he says, Whatever goes from your hand into your stomach, if it was bad, you would throw it up. But if something comes out of your heart that's evil, it's because of evil thoughts. That's what defiles you, not washing your hands. I mean, wash your hands, but it's not going to make your soul better. You wash your hands because, yeah. But you get what he's saying here. Food does not make a person bad. And when you're in the Jewish faith, there's kosher food and there's non-kosher food. There is the way you ritually kill an animal, and there's a way you should not kill an animal. There are foods that you're allowed to eat and foods that you're not allowed to eat. And he's saying, this is not about your soul in your food rules. This is about what you are having in your heart, and it's coming spewing out of your mouth. He goes to Tyre and Sidon. Again, this is modern-day Lebanon, and these were part of the Phoenician cities just north of Israel on the coast. And a woman was crying and saying, please have mercy on me, Lord. Help me. My, my child is demon possessed. And he's like, hey, I came here now for the people of Israel. I am here to help them. And he says to her, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This is not a racial comment. And then she says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And good for her for being persistent. You notice he doesn't rebuke her for being persistent just the Pharisees, because they're not doing it in good faith or with good intentions. So this falls in line of interpretation and cultural issues. He does not call her a dog in the word her, which were the awful roaming dogs that 
Jezebel was attacked by. These were pet dogs, family dogs. When I was in Israel, I found a dog cemetery. It was filled with nicely buried dogs. So there's two different kinds of dogs. In English, we just say dog. We don't really have a cur and a dog. We just say dog. So it sounds bad for the first place. This is a pet dog. And it's not like she is being called a pet either. He is saying that if you walk into the family, you wouldn't take the children's food and give it to the pet dog. This is saying, I'm here right now for the children of Israel. I'm not here for everybody else. I'm not here for the other members of the family. So it's not as bad as it sounds in the English translation. When I first got baptized, I asked my pastor about questions like this. Why does this sound so harsh? Why does it sound so mean? And he gave me this advice in looking at the Bible. If you know God is 100% mercy, 100% justice, 100% compassion, he loves us no matter what, why take one iota of text and then immediately determine he's being rude or harsh or mean in this part? What you do is you lay it down with everything else you know about God or everything else you know about Scripture and realize that this is not going to be an outlier of how Scripture is talking about anything. That's what a lot of people try to do. Oh, yeah, well, what does the Bible say about this piece? But instead, look at it as constant text, even though it's written by many authors, and it has consistency. Try to look for the consistency, not the outliers. I think in the end, that's what Jesus is saying about the brood of vipers, the Pharisees. They pick out this one thing and then saying, aha, we got you. We caught you or not following the laws of God. Are you looking to trick Jesus or are you looking to learn from him? So continuing on with this conversation, but it leads me to believe that this is in line with the other things that he's been saying. Like when he was saying, hey, are you willing to give up everything and follow me? And people were like, mm, I'll be back next week. I got to go bury my father. She's saying, please, Lord, please, I will accept any crumb from you. I don't think he's calling her a dog in that sense. I think he is trying to test her faith. I think he's trying to see how far she will go, how strong, how much she will demand that she should be healed. She felt strong in this. She didn't walk away. She didn't leave Jesus because she got called a name. And because she would accept any crumb, it was a testament to her faith. He said to her in ESV, Oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done as you desire. And her daughter was healed. She stuck to it. Her faith and determination made such an impression on Jesus. Again, he goes back to the Galilee and heals many people. And they glorified, it said, the God of Israel. People are recognizing him for who he is. So then a large crowd of people are around him again. And again, he had compassion on the crowd. There was no place. This time they were in the middle of nowhere. There was no town they could go to. There was no place they could go. They all came out to hear him and he wanted to feed them. In this case, they had seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And again, he sat them down. Someone in the commentary said that the reason Jesus keeps having the crowd sit down is because if they're starving, haven't eaten in a while, suddenly there's baskets of food all over the place, there could be a crush as everyone rushes forward in order to get the food. By making him sit down and telling him to stay sitting down, then the disciples can bring the food to them and nobody gets hurt. That was the general message. So he feeds another 4,000. Then he sends the crowd away, go home. It's over with. And then he goes to Magadan. So Magadan is probably Magdalene, Magdala, and it refers to Migdal, which is a tower. Some people say tower of fishes. People also suspect that possibly Mary Magdalene means that she was from this town. I think that's still up in the air, but this is a place he knew he's going to end this chapter by going there and meeting the people of Magdal. Some key concepts in this chapter again, is that idea of people being healed by their faith, that their faith, their determination to be with Jesus, like the woman who had the bleeding problem, who was reaching out at anything she could get to, to be healed by Jesus, that determination. And even though she was a Canaanite woman, but what mattered was her faith. What also mattered are the Pharisees and the Sadducees that keep coming to try to trick him. Why aren't you washing your hands? Why aren't you following tradition? The Bible, the word of God is the ultimate source of our truth. Tradition, I believe, 
is where the Jewish people got wrong. Again, it was the Pharisees who said, oh, three stars in the sky. It is tradition that says you have to wear this specific kind of clothing or you're not godly. Tradition is something we associate. We're pattern recognizers of anything. Human beings determine patterns. And so when we see a group of people that dress in a certain way, we say, oh, they're holy people. We should dress like them. My meditation for this week is thinking about tradition and how much tradition is good because it helps us as a people bind to something like the Christmas tradition. It's not bad because it binds us together as family, as a time of celebration, as long as we don't overwrite the real reason for Christmas. Other traditions are the same thing. Once we start putting traditions in the place of God, then we're in trouble. And one step further from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when we start judging other people by their lack of following tradition. My prayer for this week is to have the faith of the Canaanite woman. A lot of people wouldn't have given any amount of thought to her because of who she was. Jesus saw her as a human being, not as a race of people, not as a woman or a man. They just saw her as a person who had faith in him and was asking for compassion and healing for her daughter. And he granted it. How can we step out in that kind of faith, have that kind of determination and faith where we keep asking? And what I'm going to share this week is the fact that Jesus has compassion for everybody without regard to their background, their heritage, anything like that. He loves everybody in this world. And having that determination in request to God is what he's seeking from us. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please tell a friend. And if you have anything to say to me, please email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening.